the three cases? Yes. How did you exclude them? Um, I went in and uh, pretty hot. I pretty much wasn't across, but I know they have like a cross through them now, and it's safe. Like, yeah, like yeah. Yeah, and so it's sort of a handy little thing, and I'm going to show you this with SPSS, and then we'll get to this lecture material, because it is something that, that I think um, will be handy uh, uh, to have, and it'll be at the, you'll just remember that it'll be at the beginning of, uh, of, this, of this lecture. So if I open up some data, SPSS is so slow in opening on this computer, and it's actually a new computer. It could... Yeah, it's... Yeah, it's... It, I, can, I have a Windows computer that's several years <coughs> old, and it, and, and maybe because it's, it's Java, I don't know anything about Java, but it runs in a Java environment. If that's more native to a Windows environment, and, and it's not um, I don't know what that means. Maybe that I'm breaking the law. <laughs> and so, um, here's our data. And let's say we had a situation similar to, um, similar to what um, William was talking about, where I mean, the, the thing that you probably don't want to do is you could just go in here and, and right-click on this and say um, clear, and it would delete that case from the data. But then it's gone forever unless you have a, a saved copy of the data, which uh, then trying to manage all of those different saved copies with rows that you may or may not have deleted ends up being more hassle than it's worth. And so the easiest way to... Um, the easiest way to... Um, um, to, to manage that is, what I would do is do a, um, I can just do a recode, and I'm going to recode into a different variable, and I'm just going to take case ID, and um, I'm going to say this is, I'm just going to call it out, because those are the ones that I want to take out of the analysis. And so I'm going to create a new variable called out, and then um, I'm going to say all other values are going to be equal to zero. And then I'm going to say for cases um, one, I'm going to want to make it one. This is the this is the this is the ID number for the person. And so you could do it with you could do it with their you could do it with their ID number. Or if you didn't have an ID number column, you could just find another variable that would, but it would have to be a variable that would be have a unique number to that person. But in this case, I'm going to take ID number one, and I'm going to, I want them to be out. And let's say it's 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 row number 22 that I also want to be out. I'm going to say that is out, and then I'm going to say let's just say it's you know 241 is the other row that I want out, and so I'm going to say that's going to be equal to um, whoops, I'm going to say that's going to be equal to one. This needs to be um, that needs to be one. So I'm going to change. Um, I think you did add it. So. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to change everything to zero with the exception of row number one, row number 241, and row number 22. I'm going to make those one. And so I say OK, and I say OK. And then I have, uh, I should have that um, if I do. Um, if I do descriptives, frequencies. By the way, what's the difference between frequencies and descriptives? If what's there's two, those are two options, sort of similar sounding. What does frequencies give you that you wouldn't get from descriptives, and vice versa? If the vice versa applies. Descriptives, I think, um, can help you with the uh, least scores. You you can delete the box to check to check for the if you want the least scores of your variables. And um, frequencies yeah. not. Yeah. But what does frequencies give you? Frequencies give you the table topic. Yeah. Table meaning what? Whoever said that? The, um, it shows you the percentages of, for example, each answer and uh, the cumulative percentages 
Right. So frequencies will give you, you have 30 people who are 18, you have 18 people who are 19, and you get the frequencies by value in the data set. And sometimes that's useful to see. A lot of times that's useful to see. Uh, you can also get some fairly robust or some fairly decent descriptive statistics from frequencies. Um, but you get better statistics from from descriptives. You can do more with that. If so, if you just want to get the mean, median, mode, and the skewness, and the kurtosis, and and you want to get the sum, and you want to convert something to a z-score, descriptives would be what you'd want to do. If you want to see a frequency table of your data, then uh, frequency would be um, frequency would be the would be the better option. So this variable that I created should have everything. Um, yeah, so I have three ones and 665 zeros. And then what you can do is we can do data and we can do select cases. Is this what you did, William? Yeah, yeah so we can do data, select cases. And this is essentially telling SPSS who to use in the data and who not. And there's several, you can just say, use a random sample of 35% of the data, or you can say if some condition is satisfied. And in our case, the, the if is if this is equal to um, one, right? We want, and so I'm going to say continue. Uh, actually, it's got to be it's the other way. If this is equal to zero, did you? Is that what you said, Chris? Yeah. So if this is equal to zero, because this is who I, who you're selecting to be in the analysis, not who you're selecting to be out of the analysis. And so in this case, out is going to be equal to um, zero, and I can say okay, and you can see if I go back to the data. You can see that there it says filter on, meaning that there's a filter on that we're uh, removing some cases. And then for case number one, this is the, the, the mark that William was referencing. And if we go down to 22, we see the same mark. And whatever two, whatever uh, 242 or whatever the other case was, we'd see the same number. So if you find data that, or rows of data that you don't want to work with because of problems, whatever that problem is, this would be the solution that, that I would employ or something similar to this instead of going through and deleting that person or those rows of, of data. Does that make sense? And so we're going to spend um, more time talking about regression than any other one topic in this class. And I think with good reason, it is by far, maybe not in communication, but, but across uh, the sciences, including the social sciences, it's by far the most used um, uh, statistical uh, algorithm, might be uh, one way to put it. It's used far more than, than, um, than other places. So for example, uh, when I took a class similar to this, we started out talking about t-test, ANOVA, and then we did regression, which is, which is, which is reasonable. But really, a t-test is just a special case of a regression analysis. And an ANOVA is just also a special case of a regression analysis. And so it makes more sense to me to start with regression, understand it, and then we can look at some special cases that, that, that would fall under um, that same logic, that same intuition that we'll build up over the next several weeks regarding, uh, regarding uh, regression. So uh, very common, um, if you read political science literature, they don't use t-test or ANOVA almost, I, I don't know that I've ever read an article that, there's probably some examples, but it's almost, it's almost never. Um, psychology would be the exception where they tend to use, because they do more experimental studies, they tend to use ANOVA a bit more. Um, and COM is sort of a hybrid where you, there's some people that, that, that for whatever reason, that's just their training, they do, uh, they tend to use uh, ANOVA as their their um, sort of go-to analytic tool. 
and um, other people tend to gravitate towards regression. At the end of the day, um, in almost every case, the results would be the same, whether you use regression. If you try to replicate your uh, ANOVA in regression, you'll get exactly the same results. And likewise, if you try to replicate your re regression analysis using an ANOVA function, you'll get, again, exactly the same results. In some cases, there might be a few discrepancies in terms of, um, in terms of um, findings, but, but they, would be, they would be quite minor, uh, I think, um, uh, for, the, for the most part. Um, and so we're going to talk about and start with uh, the simple, just the regression where we have one independent variable to predict the value of one criterion or dependent variable. And um, it's not particularly common. Most people, if they had a, if, if they had a, a problem like this and they, where they just had an outcome and, a, and a, an independent variable, they probably would just do a correlation. It'd be probably a more common way to do it. Um, but but, it, but it, 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 does have, it does have some, there's some value there. But for us, the value really comes from sort of the understanding and the intuition we can build up for well, what is regression? Uh, understand uh, sort of at an intuitive level uh, what's, what's, what's it trying to do or what is it doing with the data? We're not going to work out formulas of how it comes up with the results that it comes up with, but it will understand at a, at a higher level what what the this particular kind of regression that we call uh, ordinary least squares regression or OLS regression what what's it trying to do and in our case it's it's trying to minimize a thing and it is minimizing a thing and and we'll understand well what is that thing that it's minimizing and we'll know that and we'll know what that thing is and we'll know how to calculate that thing and so uh, the the whole idea here for the this class period is to just build up some understanding of of regression and what we're trying to do. And then move on uh, quickly to the case where we have uh, several independent variables and uh, still a single dependent variable that we're, that we're trying to predict. And that's the, the more uh, interesting for sure and the more applicable to the research problems that you guys are probably interested in, in understanding as opposed to just the, the bivariate regression problem. So that's, that's the plan, and that's sort of why we, we start with regression, because it does provide us with a nice foundation. I'll be able to reference back to this when we start talking about ANOVA and say we could do the same analysis with regression, but it's, instead of, instead of um, letting SPSS create the interaction term, we could create the interaction term and, 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 um, and come up with the same results. And so... Um, I, I think it, it pr provides a, a nice um, uh, foundation for us to um, get started with. Uh, and then um, with just about all of the different types of um, analytical tools that we talk about in this class, there'll be a, a page that's similar to this where we talk about data assumptions. And these are things that I think we need to know. And so in your notes, you should put these are things that we need to know. And, um, there, and you'll find that there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of commonality across uh, the different procedures that we'll use in this class. And so uh, no, no one, every one of these that we work with, there'll be, there'll be uh, probably more overlap with this than there is uniqueness, but there will be, there will be um, there will be some uniqueness as well. And so the first assumption is that for our variables that are measured on a continuous scale, that is interval or ratio level, the distributions need to be normal or um, fairly normal. And that is the assumption of the test. And to the extent that you violate normality, you shouldn't have confidence in the results that you're getting. So if you have some uh, really skewed uh, uh, variable and you decide you're not going to try to transform it into something 
that uh, is uh, more normal, then, and you're going to do some statistics with it, be it ANOVA or, excuse me, regression, you should um, just keep that in mind that, that, that these results may not replicate if others try to replicate your research because the data is, is, is non-normal. So the assumption is the data comes from um, a normally distributed uh, distribution, as we talked about last week, with skewness and kurtosis equal to zero. Obviously, it's not going to be exactly equal to zero, but uh, the assumption is that it is equal to zero. Uh, the variables are measured on interval or ratio scales. That includes the, the independent and the dependent variable. And um, so the dependent variable with the kind of regression we're going to talk about will always be on an interval or ratio scale. Just one more time. The dependent variable for the kind of regression we're going to talk about in this class, in this class, has to be measured on an interval or ratio scale. The independent variables can be interval, ratio, or dichotomous, uh, just dichotomous. And so if you have a nominal variable called political party, somebody was working with, I think Amanda, when I was talking to her yesterday, she has a variable called political party. And uh, here in the States, people are what? They're Republican, they're Democrat, or we call them independents, right? And there's, there, there, there'd be some other, but that would make up probably what, 98% or maybe, maybe even uh, uh, greater than that uh, of, most, uh, of most of the public. And so let's say we had that nominal variable. Um, what would we do to make it into dichotomies? What's that, what's that process that we've talked about in this class? So we demicode it, yep. And so let's say we have Republican, Democrat, Independent. How would we, how might we dummy code that? Your party of interest and then not your party of interest, maybe? So if you're, if you're interested in like what Republicans think, is your Republicans and your non Republicans? Um, one more time, I like that. But, so but if, you're, I'm, if you're interested in like what Republicans think, or Democrats, or whatever, then, I, then you could take like Republicans or zero, and then everybody else is a one. And then you could. Yeah, yeah. So that would be that would be that would be a that would be a solution for a particular problem where where the interest might be more focused on on some uh, that type of comparison. Um, another solution might be I don't know that it's better. Another solution. And so you'd make two IVs, and what would they two IVs be again? So everybody that's a Democrat or a Republican is going to be a one else zero. And, and what would that tell us? Why would we do that? Compare it with the because uh, I already know. Yeah, that's not that's not the first thing that would come to mind. But there might be research challenges that where that would be appropriate. Uh, the one thing that remember in in the when we talked about demi coding, does anybody remember the k minus one? What does that mean? What is that? Any, Yeah, so if we have three, if our, if our nominal variable has three levels, Democrat, Republican, and Independent, we should code that into no more than K minus one, or in this case, two demi variables. And we could, to me, if I were going to do this analysis, and, and the, the examples that were given are, are completely appropriate. Uh, for some examples, but I think I would probably be most interested in dummy coding one of them, Democrat, and if we're thinking about um, Amanda's data in particular, where she's looking at whether people, how, how believable they thought 
real news was and how believable they thought fake news was. And, 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 and so uh, for me, the two parties that would be, or the two groups that would be most of interest would be Democrats. And so you'd have one variable called Democrat. So anybody who identified themselves as a Democrat would be called at one, else zero. And then we have another variable called Republicans. Everybody would be recorded Republican, else zero. And then how would we know who the independents are? Yeah, they're going to be zero on both of them, and so they're going to be they're going to be independent. And in fact, if you tried to do an independent, so you had three, you did k instead of k minus one. Uh, SPSS and any other software uh, either will send an error message saying I can't process this because two of these are perfectly correlated with the third one, uh, and so it, it'll either SPSS will just uh, uh, in a somewhat arbitrary way get rid of one of the three for you. And I think, I don't know which one it selects. It might be the last one that you added in, or it might be the first one you added in, but it's going to get rid of one of them, and then it will run the analysis, and it'll give you a little warning message saying, I had to drop this variable because of um, uh, uh, columnarity, or in this case, it would be what we call singularity. Um, and so remember when you're getting back to our assumptions here, when you're doing your regression analysis, you need to think through every one of your variables. Is my dependent variable continuous? Yes. Are each of my independent variables either continuous or dichotomies? And if you can't answer that, uh, you need to go, you need to fix that. Don't do an analysis, because an SPSS doesn't care. You could give it political party ID, and it would just take it as one, two, and three, and it would, uh, but, but the, it, it doesn't have any meaning, right? One is not, in this case, if one represents Democrat, two represents Republican, one is not greater or less than the, the numbers are, are, um, are arbitrary. And so um, uh, we just need to, we need to make sure. And so when you see assignment number two, where you're going to do a regression analysis, your analysis will be fatally flawed if you don't make sure that this is covered. If you try to do a, if you try to do a regression with a nominal variable that's not dummy coded, um, the results are meaningless and um, it's fatally flawed. Likewise, if you try to do, don't use a dichotomy as a dependent variable either. The dependent variable has to be a continuous variable, not a dichotomy. There are other forms of regression that we're not going to talk about in this class, but there's other forms of regression that are made to do dichotomies as a dependent variable. But we're not going to talk about those in this class. Just curious, I know yeah. in the first assignment, you said we should be working with like around five variables. Is it still going to be like around five? Or are we moving Yeah, I think with the, now, with the assignment number two, I say you need to have a dependent variable. And I don't know if I say three or four okay. independent variables. And Just trying to Yeah, there's always some flexibility there, right? There's always, I, I try not to be, um, uh, if, if you only have, if I say use four and you only have three and you send me an email and say, I just can't do it with four because I don't have four. I'd probably say, fine, just do it with the three. Uh, I, four is, is somewhat of an arbitrary number that I pull out of, um, out of that, that I just use. So first two assumptions, good, right? Normal distributions, interval of ratio level da data, with the exception of the independent variable that could be, independent variables that could be dichotomies. Um, uh, we need to model linear relationships. Uh, Unless we're specifically, again, we could, and, and, and towards the end of this class, uh, time permitting, <coughs> not, not this class this afternoon, but this class like week 15, time permitting, we'll talk about nonlinear models, and we'll talk about modeling nonlinear data. Um, but but the, the assumption is that our relationships are, are linear because that's, uh, that is what... Um, and that's what we're going to model for. And, and without explicitly modeling for nonlinear relationships, we have to we have to um, make the assumption that that's the case. What's an example of a nonlinear relationship? Just so we're all, or a nonlinear model. What's a linear model? What's that? As one thing goes up, the other thing goes up, or as one goes down, the other goes down, or as one goes up, the other goes down, and they tend to be. What's that? 
this would be a curvilinear wouldn't be a linear line. Oh, I thought yeah. you said. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was asking for. I started with uh, nonlinear, and so curvilinear would be a would be a not linear. Uh, what can anybody think of an example of? What's an example of two things that might the relationship? There's a lot of things that are. That they're nonlinear. They're curvilinear. In what way? Weather and what? Just make sure we're all on the same page. I would think that as temperatures increase, people eat more ice cream. And at really extremely cold temperatures, people, maybe when it's really, really cold, people don't eat ice cream. And when it's really, really hot, people don't eat ice cream. If that were the case, then it would be nonlinear, right? I just don't. I don't buy it if that's... Isn't there, isn't there a common one about like anxiety, like if you study so much for a test, like it goes up, but then like you can get to a point where you've like studied too much, so it doesn't yeah. really actually help, and then you go back down. Isn't that the popular... Yeah, the... I think an easy way is... Hours, that's all like anxiety. Yeah. That's like one. attractiveness and the amount of makeup you wear. What's that? Attractiveness and the amount of makeup you wear. Like if you have no makeup, like the attractiveness is usually low, but if you put on more so much makeup you're like a mom, <laughs> so it's a curve. Um, but uh, and the attractiveness is obviously uh, a matter of uh, it's, it's yeah, perception, right? It's, it's subjective. The one that I like that I use is the relationship between, um, and you guys know this if you've taught public speaking, between um, uh, speaking apprehension and the final grade that the student gets on a speech, right? So if the student is not at all anxious about standing in front of 30 people and giving a speech, um, they're writing some notes on a note card as they're walking over from their uh, fraternity, right? And they're, they're sitting down and they've got their snails and they stand in front of the class and they just, they just talk and there's no structure to the talk and, and they think they nailed it and they get a D on it, on it right? They just, they just, they, but, but because there's no anxiety, they don't, they don't feel any need there's no anxiety there about, about the situation. They don't, they're not motivated. Uh, likewise, the person who's really, really anxious, and how many people have taught public speaking? Everybody? Most of everybody? And those are really uncomfortable to be in the class, right? When the student is so, like they're shaking at the podium, like the, um, and the worst one, this is, this is, um, I didn't experience this, but this is somebody in Oklahoma <coughs> City uh, who was in a class that I taught a few years back, said she actually had somebody who, who wet his pants oh, no. in front of the class, that he was so anxious, and he was wearing uh, khaki pants, which um, doesn't uh, help the situation. And then he, did, he went and sat down afterwards. Um, and so she was an awkward situation, and, and sort of the extreme, right? That really, really nervous, Made everybody in the class probably really nervous or just uncomfortable, right? Especially when you, when you, but that's the beauty of it, right? Uh, even, even, but just the person who's nervous, right? And, and they're, you can just tell, maybe they're just reading, they, they, they can't speak uh, extemporaneously. They got everything written out on a little card, and even though you tell them not to write things out, they re write everything out and they try to hide their notes and they just read it to you uh, from behind the podium or something, right? That is not a very good speech. And the reason that they probably got to that place is because uh, they were just so they were just so anxious about having to, to stand in front of their peers and deliver that message. And then the, the person who probably does the best, and I know this from my experience, it, is when you have a small amount of anxiety, right? That anxiety is motivated, right? And, and I'm I just I just I just I, I want to present myself well. I want to you know I want to you know be um, you know a positive influence, or I want to do a good job, I want to, I think this will reflect on me and my family or whatever, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do everything I can um, and to, to be prepared and have my, uh, my speech to deliver, and that's the person who probably does, in terms of a final grade, uh, the best on the speech, and so that relationship would be curved linear, it'd be an inverse U, right? Where the, where if we had, um, <coughs> If we had, um, if this is, um, this is gray here, and this is, uh, this is anxiety, it would look like this, right, where the person is really anxious, they have a low grade, the person who's not anxious at all, they have a low grade, and the, and the person who's sort of somewhere in the middle would have, um, would have um, the higher.
class, right? So that would be an example, and we could model for that, uh, but we're not modeling for that with the analysis that we're doing, at least now, and again later in the semester, um, time permitting, we can look at how we can um, uh, test for those kinds of those kinds of nonlinear effects. Does that make sense? So normal distributions, interval or ratio level measured, with the exception of dichotomous models, independent variables, linear models. Uh, independent observations. This is a standard across any statistical test that uses a, a, an F table or a T table or a Z table. The assumption is, is that each observation in your data set is independent of every other observation in the data set. Um, you can take that to the extreme and then you would say, well, then there's no data that we can work with, but that would be, that would be the extreme of that. Um, probably some common violations of that assumption would be if I did a study and the data that I was collecting, I went to my class and I said, can I have you fill out this survey for me and then also take this survey and distribute it to 10 of your friends? And then, uh, or 10 of your family members, uh, and then I included all of that data in my analysis. Those, those observations are not independent of each other. If I'm one of your students, the people that I'm going to, to ask them to complete the survey, they're, they're, they're connected to me. They're not independent of me. And so there would be that there would be that dependency that would be that would be a part of uh, of the, the data that you're working with, and so that would be that would be an example. Um, you do see it happening, um, and I've read published reports where the author clearly says they distributed the survey instrument to their students, and they had their students all go out and find ten friends, and um, it gets published. Uh, but I've also been on the other side of that where, well, I've written, written plenty of reviews where I say, you violated the, the assumption of independence of observation. Um, this data is not, is not applicable. I've also worked for an editor when I was a grad student. And I saw other reviewers writing the same kinds of reviews when those situations happened. And so, um, the the and so we, this could be taken to an extreme, right? Where where uh, well, we're all on planet Earth, right? So in some ways, we're we're all dependent in that way, or we're all we all are uh, connected to the University of Oklahoma in some way, or we're we're residents of this the the city of Norman, or uh, residents of the state of Oklahoma. So there would be there would be those extremes, and I'd call all of those extremes would probably not be um, violations that would be, um, that would be particularly problematic. There are some tests that one can do to see if you're violating that assumption. They tend not to be used that much. Um, but there are some <coughs> tests that, that, that I've seen um, where, you can, where you can do those kinds of tests. Um, does this make sense? So our observations need to be independent. And then finally, as we'll talk about when we talk about diagnosing um, uh, the regression uh, analyses that we're doing, is we have to, our independent variables cannot be correlated with each other to a high degree. And, and you say, well, what is a high degree? And it's, it, it, it matters some in the context. And so we'll, we'll talk about that, uh, we'll talk about that in, uh, in detail when we get to that sort of regression diagnostics portion of, of this class. But uh, uh, colonarity, some people just call it colonarity, some people call it multicolonarity. Uh, colonarity, I guess, would just be two. Uh, multicolonarity could be where we'd have uh, three or more things that are in, in combinations, uh, 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 highly correlated with each other. So it has nothing to do with the correlation of the independent variable to the dependent variable. It has everything to do with the independent variables to the other independent variables. Okay, and, and, and it causes 
it causes all kinds of chaos with the estimation techniques that get used, and and um, and we just need to be aware of that. Singularity would be if we had two variables that were perfectly correlated, or or some combination of variables that were perfectly correlated. If we did Democrat, Republican, and Independent, one of those, any one of those would be perfectly correlated with the other two, and that would be the technical name for that would be singularity, is, is what is how we would um, what we because it's perfectly correlated, the relationship is 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 1.0 um, and um, and and it, 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 we, we refer to it just a bit differently. And it doesn't matter if the relationship is inverse or direct. So either one causes causes problems. And so um, those are our assumptions. Any questions there? Comments? It needs to be less than one, right? If <laughs> less uh, or or absolute one, um, yeah. Point seven is probably the first thing that comes to the top of my head, but and in most cases, point seven is going to be a problem when we start looking at things using some of the tools that we'll look at in a few weeks. Point seven will probably almost always be, but in some cases, point five <coughs> can also be a problem. But if it's it's not point two, and it's it's. Um, um, it's not point two where 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 it causes where 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 it starts starts to cause problems, in um, because what it does is it it inflates the coefficients that we'll start talking about here in a few minutes. It inflates those coefficients in an artificial way, and and um, you end up with you end up with really strange results that that. Um, theoretically are not possible, but are only an artifact of, you know, highly correlated independent variables. Um, so, uh, if press 0.7 probably be a number that you could uh, keep somewhere in the back of your mind. All right? So, um, just so an example to sort of motivate our, our thinking here and to help us um, and, and what we're doing here is not, not we're not delving into, um, we're not delving into the details of how we calculate the regression analysis. What we're doing is staying at least a couple levels above that, and we want to understand the intuition behind what what's actually happening behind the scenes, what's actually happening in the black box that we call SPSS. And you could take a mathematics class and you could do, you could do, well, when I, back in the day, we actually had to do it with calculator and we had to hand calculate out regression equations. I don't, I don't see a lot of value in people doing that period. And it wasn't with data sets that had N equals 100, it was small data sets, but we all know how to use calculators. I just don't. I, I don't find a lot of. I don't find a lot of value in there. Although I think some uh, math department, some other departments might might focus more on on that that the intuition would be at a at a sort of a level below where we're at. We're going to try to stay. Uh, we're going to try to stay above the the that level of detail. Uh, that isn't to say that there's not plenty of math in what we're looking at, but the math, the most difficult thing will be square and square root, right? That is as, as difficult as it gets. Likewise, to calculate it by hand, like the old thing that we used to do with calculators, if you knew how to do square and square root, you're, that's all you needed to know how to do, and then plug things into formulas, and that's as complicated as it gets with where we're at, um, with, with, with where we're at here. And so the data that we're gonna use to try to motivate our understanding here is some made-up data where I have, um, as you can see, uh, 10 observations. I have um, the salary that the person's making. Each row is a person. And I have the salary that the person's making. Then I have the number of publications 
that they that they have. Okay, and um, and this is we're gonna we're gonna use this data to, to sort of work through a couple um, uh, a couple issues that that are that are um, <coughs> sort of again provide the foundation of, of our understanding here. But let's say let's say we didn't have the number of publications. Um, let's say all we had is salary. All we had is salary, which is the question I'm asking here. What would be the best predictor of salary for one, anyone in the population if the sample salary was all that we had? So I gave you some data. It's just a bunch of salary for communication professors. And I said, okay, tell me what Give me a prediction of what Michael Kramer makes. Give me a prediction, and that's all, that's all you can use, is that, that column of data that I gave you. Give me a prediction of what Michael Kramer makes. Give me a prediction of what, um, we used to call him Upstairs Kramer, uh, uh, Eric Kramer makes. <laughs> upstairs Kramer, Downstairs Kramer, right? Uh, give me a prediction of what, what Ryan makes or whatever, right? Um, what would you do? What would be your best predictor? We don't have another variable. All we have is salary. Do you average it? No. Meaning average, meaning what? Take the mean. And then we'll do what? That would be the predictor or prediction? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Good, yeah, good, good answer. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you got it. Uh, absent any other information, the best predictor would be to the mean of the salary variable. We just we just would say upstairs Kramer is the mean, downstairs Kramer is the mean, Ryan Beisel is the mean, because that's all we, that, I'm, in this hypothetical. That's all we have. And um, and the average would be or the mean would be would be would be our best predictor. And so the question is is how much error would there be in our predictions? How much, if we, if we said, we're just gonna use salary, our mean, and everybody gets that, regardless of any other information we know about the person, how much error would we have in our predictions? How accurately would our predictions be? Is, is, is the question, is the, the, the question that I'm I'm asking here, and um, this doesn't. Well, we could come back to this, and we'd be able to derive it from from the table that I have of descriptive statistics there. But but by itself, right now, it won't get us there. But what we do know is, for this, if, let's say we're let's say we were um, we were gonna we're using this sample data and this sort of hypothetical that we're working in. We would say everybody makes sixty-four thousand five hundred and fifty dollars a year because that's our average, and so that's that. Everybody gets that value, and so you can look at a graph that looks like this. I hope I don't have transitions in there everywhere. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, this uh, this graph. This is the mean, and then these are all of, and these are just the ID numbers, right? Our ten, our ten people, even though for those eleven, I only I only do ten. And so this this is just a, a not a very smart graph, and not a very not a particular useful graph other than for, for this uh, one purpose that that I'm trying to demonstrate here is so for person number one our prediction would be sixty four thousand five hundred fifty five dollars, but they actually make closer to sixty thousand dollars right if you go back and look at the screen you'll be able to figure that out. And so there, we, we made an error there, right? We made a, a pretty substantial error. This one we're pretty, we're a lot closer to, right? Uh, not so good, not so good, not good at all. Getting a little better. And so we can see that there's, we can see that there are, there's errors that we're making. If we, if we added up the length of each of these lines on the top, that were that where we where our where our prediction was below what they actually made. If we added up the links of those lines with the links of the lines on the bottom, they would cancel each other out because they're going to be they're going to be exactly 
they're going to be exactly the same length. If we had a fancy computer program, wouldn't it be that fancy? How long is this? And it would just be a dollar amount that we could get, right? And how, what's the dollar amount here? And what's the dollar amount here? And here and here. Or we could take a, a, a tape measure if you want to do it old school way, and you could stick it here, and you could just say, well, how long is this? And forget about what the y axis is. And and the length is going to be the length of the top is going to be equal to the length below the below the mean. This length is going to be equal to this length, and we uh, that's that's one of the challenges that we have that we have. So this is this is this data uh, plotted here, but then moved to moved to this table where we have each person's salary. This is our mean salary. This is the difference. This difference, and the difference is the we're looking at the the points above and the points below, right? It gives us the difference. If it's a if it's a negative number, it's a point uh, above. If it's a, a positive number, it's a point below. Um, and if we sum these up, these will always sum to zero. This is that's zero with the rounding error. That's uh, uh, 13 decimal places out. So it's essentially zero. These will always sum to zero. This column always sums to zero. If it doesn't, you made a mistake with your math here somewhere. And so the fix that we use, because we know that this always sums to zero, so it's not particularly useful in helping us understand the amount of error, we take the square we take the square of each of these, right? So in, in this case, we're taking the square of minus 4.35 with 18.92, and we sum all of those up. And we call this the sum of squared errors. That sum is called the sum of squared errors. And so one way to think about one way to think about that question that I posed on the slide where I said, well, how many, if we just use the mean, how would we calibrate our errors? How many, what, what would, to what degree are we going to be making errors? And one answer to that question, and probably the most common answer to that question, well, let's calculate the sum of squared errors, and that would be the, that would be a, uh, a way for us to think about the amount of error that we have in um, in our prediction, where we're using the mean for all um, where we're using the mean for all um, all predictions. And so the question is: is if we add a predictor to our analysis? In the example that we're talking about, it's going to be number of publications. If we use a predictor, can we reduce the amount of error? Does it, does it make a meaningful contribution in the reduction of, 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 of the total errors or the sum of squared errors that we have? So far, so good? Questions? We're good? Everybody would be able to do this. Ma the math is really simple, right? A little tedious, right? Just to calculate it or um, do a couple square roots. Or just a square. We're not even doing a square root here. Um, does anybody know where we use this value? Um, where else that's useful? So if we're going to calculate standard deviation. So if we do standard deviation, um, the standard deviation is going to be the, um, the um, it's going to be uh, F S E sum of squared errors. It's going to be the square root of that divided by n minus one. And so, if you've ever had to calculate standard deviation by hand, which is something that we make undergraduates do when we run out of things to teach them. Um, um, 
that would be that would be the that would be the formula that we use for that would be the formula that we um, that we'd use uh, uh, and and we we'd build the table that looks exactly like this table and we'd get this value and then we just plug in uh, n minus one and um, and and take the square root and that would be our standard deviation. Um, So having said that, here's the standard deviation for our data. How would we convert that back to? How would we convert that back to sum of squares? Right? How would we get? How how could we confirm? Sorry. How could we take this number here, 5.91? Let's round it to. And confirm that this is the correct number. Let's say I did. Let's say I didn't give you this. So let's say, and. and or you didn't want to calculate that. You, I just told you give me the sums of squares total. How could you use this? What would be the first thing you do? Take a minute. Work, think about it with your neighbor. Give me a time to drink uh, some water and think about how we could calculate. Think about how we could calculate sums of squares from just the standard deviation. Okay, and see if you can match the number that I have. It might not round to exactly that, but it should be. It's it's fairly close. When I did it, when I did it to just two decimal places, close enough. Off a little bit though. So what would you do? Anybody got the? Danny's got the magic. Um, what would you do, Danny? Multiply it by n minus one. In our case, um, nine, right? So taking the square. Uh, we'll get rid of the square root there, and then we just instead of dividing by n, we're just going to multiply by n minus one, and it comes pretty close. I did it to I did five point nine one, and I came up with um, I came up with um, three fourteen point three five, which is off a little bit, but it's all it's all about the rounding that we're doing. Does it make sense? So intuitively, if you can get that far in your if if that makes sense, um, you're doing great. If it doesn't, keep thinking about it and trying to figure out, because if you understand how to get this back to sums of squares total, um, then you, you understand the little bit of math that we were talking about. And it'll just be, it'll be useful as we, as we continue to talk. Because we're just going to layer on top of this now over the next, over the next um, uh, couple hours that we have, okay? So we have our total or sums of squared errors. And um, and so, what happens if we can? How can we reduce, or can we reduce that ability, or that that error amount, that total error amount? This number, can we reduce that number by adding um, an independent variable? And in this case, we're just talking about single variable, single meaning one independent variable regression. So. Um, I have a plot on your left that is a plot of publications to salary. And we can see there's a line there, right? We can see that there's a, there looks like there's a, there looks like there's a positive relationship. If you just sort of look at those points, it looks like as, as publications go up, so does salary, right? There's a general, there's a general uh, tendency for it to move in that direction. And, and you can see from this line that I drew, I didn't draw it, the computer drew it, but from this line that the computer drew, which is the regression line, this is the line that best fits that data. And by best 
fit that data. Um, if I said, well, I want to draw a line here, and let's use that for our regression line, you'd say, no, that's not a very good line because you're not you're making a lot more errors there than you really need to. Or if I said, well, I just want to do this, I want to just do something like this, like this, you'd say, that school is just doesn't work either. Or if I said, we just need a line down here, I think that's the best line. You would also say, that just doesn't seem like that's the right place to draw that line if we want to use that line to predict um, our data. Um, and and so what what and this is this is one level of intuition that we can we can think about. What regression does for us is it picks the line that minimizes the error. There's no other line that we could draw through the data. We couldn't move it uh, any up or down or or change the slope or change the intercept in any way that would get us less error. And so that's what that's what the regression algorithm that we're going to use, and I, I'll show you the name. We refer to it as ordinary least squares regression or OLS regression. That's what it that's what it's doing. It is minimizing the the errors that we have. And it's more specifically it's minimizing the squared errors because we have the same challenge that we have when we're creating sums of squares where the values will sum to zero. And so we have to square them so they don't we have to square we'd have to square these errors uh, or or they would they would sum to zero. So uh, at one level of intuition you should think about regression as um, being a procedure that finds the line that best fits your data. And then we can think a little bit about, um, we can think a little bit about um, that it best fits the data, our prediction of y is maximized, does not in any way mean that it's perfect. It just means given that independent variable, you cannot do it any better than what the regression line is that is picked out. And our error is minimized. Our ability to predict is maximized. Error is minimized. And the regression line, and this is the more specific part, the regression line minimizes the squared differences between the actual and the predicted values of y. And I'll show you that in just a minute. And again, this is we refer to this as uh, ordinary least squares regression. And so this is the only kind of regression we'll talk about in this class. Really, really common. And um, um, uh, lots of applicability. Uh, the, you just have to remember those assumptions that we talked about early on where your dependent variable is a continuous variable. Um, so far, so good? Confusion? No? And so think back to when, uh, what grade did we learn the equation for a straight line? Is that eighth grade math? Sixth grade. Sixth grade. Sixth grade. They keep going down. Do they keep going down? So it's like sixth grade. I, I was probably. I thought sixth grade. Did you? You, you talked about yeah. straight line? Yeah. And so for me, it's probably senior in high school. No, <laughs> not, probably not quite that bad. But um, it has gone down. And, and because I, I think, uh, so the equation for a, re, a straight line, as you may or may not recall, uh, could be written as, and, and this is this might not be the way that you would teach your sixth graders how to write it, um, but this is the way that we'd write, write it for for this case where we have uh, some y value is equal to some intercept times some slope times some plus some slope times uh, some some value, and um, if you think about that equation. Um, a is A is the value of y when x is equal to zero, right? And so, uh, if we look at our regression equation for the data that we're working with, our predicted salary 
is equal to an intercept of 55.481 plus 3.14 times the number of publications, right? The same format is up here. And so if I have zero publications, what's my predicted salary? About $55,481. Does that make sense? And um, B indicates, and this is this is the this is a key uh, understanding here, is that B indicates the expected change in Y associated with a unit change in X. Uh, ingrain that in your mind, because as we start to do and look at, and as you read research, having that be just sort of, uh, uh, you know, intuitively, you know, you, 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 can, you can look at the B value and you can say, oh yeah, one change in X will lead to this predicted amount of change in Y. In our case, um, B indicates the expected change in Y associated with a change in number of publications, right? Easy enough, right? So we could take this, this, and if we put that data that I had on the previous screen, and we told SPSS to use the same regression function that you did, that you used with the Mahal and Abyss, uh, it would come up with an intercept and a slope that would be exactly equal to these. And eventually we'll get to SPSS, but um, it's not, um, it's not, uh, we, we won't get to it until next week, unless we really start moving. So, so far so good. And so, um, of course, the correlation between X and Y is hopefully not going to be, you should be worried, right? If the correlation between your independent and dependent variable is perfect, um, that, I, I don't know what you, I don't know what you, that's, that's more of a problem than having no correlation between them. Uh, and so, uh, there's always going to be some error, right? The correlation, when we're dealing with humans and we're collecting human data, they do things like they do to William and they tell him they had 50 classes when they've had one class and they tell you that they're 105 when they're, you know, 25. And so, uh, but even, even with, save those kinds of uh, uh, people manipulating uh, or, or, or just giving you bad data, uh, when we deal with social phenomena, the correlations, they're just not ever perfect. There's always going to be, there's always going to be some error in, in, in the social phenomena that, that we work with. And so um, uh, the key understanding here is that the regression is going to determine the value for the slope and the intercept so that that error is minimized. There's no other slope. You, if you move it even a, even a hundredth or a tenth or uh, the smallest amount, it's going to increase the amount of error, either the slope or the intercept. There's no other value that you could, um, there's no other value that you could use that would um, get you um, that would get you uh, less less air, and um, this thing that it's minimizing for us is the actual y score minus the predicted y score, and then we have to square those, and we sum them. If we didn't square them, they would sum to zero. So we square them and then we sum them. And so that's what I have here. And uh, the uh, row number one, that person made $60,000. They had three publications. Plug those two numbers into that. Uh, 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 plug this number into that equation that I had on the previous page. And I get a predicted salary of uh, $59,424. And I take their actual salary minus the predicted salary, and I get the residual. That's that's actual minus the predicted, and I get this column 
Um, my label isn't centered very well, but it's this column called residual. Sum that column up, it's going to round to zero. So we take the square of it. And uh, we refer to that as the sum of squares residual. So what we did is we took their publications, plugged it into the equation, came up with the predicted amount, took the difference between their actual and the predicted to get the residual, and then we squared that to that um, to, to, to uh, alleviate that problem. And there'd be other ways to alleviate it, but the way that mathematicians have, we square. I mean, you could, there'd be other things you could do um, that would take the absolute value would be another way, but uh, the, the, the fix that is, is most often used is to square those values. And we get this thing referred to sums of squares residual. And um, in a little bit, we'll, we'll see that we also have a thing called sums of squares regression. And then we also, we just saw sums of squares total, right? Sums of squares total is the 313 uh, that we had on the previous page, that sums of squares total. This is sums of squares residual, and then we're going to see sums of squares regression here in a little bit. The way that my sort of funky way to keep them straight in my mind, at least when I was at your stage, is I always refer to this as bad sums of squares, and then sums of squares regression is the good sums of squares. Uh, if if good is meaning making fewer errors, which, which all things being equal, that we want to make fewer errors, right? And so this is bad sums of squares, and then we have good sums of squares, which is sums of squares regression. And bad in that, again, bad in that, um, as that increases, we're not as accurate in our prediction. And as, but as sums of squares regression increases, we're, our prediction is, is more accurate. So you'll see that in just a minute. I don't think I have on the slide the uh, good and bad um, sums of squares. Um, so far, so good? So how well does a regression prediction y, uh, how well does the regression equation predict y when compared to just using the mean, which is what we did initially? And so our sums of squared errors for y mean was 313.89 from the slide where I did that calculation. And we call that sums of squares total. Sums of squares residual, which we just, bad sums of squares, right, that we just calculated on the previous uh, slide, is 111.9319. And so if you sort intuitively, well, how much did it improve? Well, it would be the difference between the two, right? That would be uh, uh, one way to think about it. And uh, if we take our, if we take our, um, if we take our sums of squares total and subtract from it the errors that we made, that leaves us with our improvement. And we call that sums of squares regression. We can also get sums of squares regression by taking each predicted score minus the mean and squaring those would, in our case, it would equal 201.96. So it just would be, it's another way, it would be another way to, to do that calculation. But just remember that sums of squares total, the 313, the thing that we calculated was just using the mean is equal to sums of squares um, residual plus sums of squares regression. And if we know any two of those, we can easily get the third, right? So there, it, would, it would make no sense to calculate the third by hand unless you just felt um, compelled to for some reason. Because if you know two of them, you can easily, pay, easily get the third. And so the y-intercept and the b that is calculated for us when we do 
ordinary least squared regression is calculated in a way that sums of squared residual is minimized. Again, we could change our, we could change the intercept or the slope, and our residual will always go up. There's no other values you could put in there that would get you a lower, that would get you a lower um, uh, sums of squares residual. And so that is that is another piece of the intuition that 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 hopefully you can as we think about regression over the next uh, uh, couple class periods, you can, you can be thinking about that, that what, what the machine is doing for us is actually fairly sophisticated and it's, it's minimizing this thing that we could, we could do it by hand, right? It, it's not, we could just start, we could just start plugging in values for our intercept and slope and we could maybe start with some extreme values and so we could find a range then we could we could start and we could spend the better part of probably a couple of weeks and eventually we'd probably get to uh, eventually we'd probably get to pretty close to but we could just pass those um, two columns of data to uh, a, a function called uh, OLS regression and it will give us that intercept and what that slope should be questions Um, take about 15 minutes, and then we'll come back and uh, finish up for sure week one. Don't forget this Thank you. 90.4%. Oh, it's, um, yeah, it's the percent of freshmen that, that yeah. And so, uh, it is, we're good. Yeah. Let me shut the video off before I get too nervous and forget.